Welcome to Backstory with your hosts, Mylar's bandmates and lifelong friends, Quig and Danny. The guys have lots of fun episodes coming, so please take a second to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss anything. Now, here's your hosts, Quig and Danny. Welcome to Backstory. I'm Quig. And I'm Danny. And on this episode of Backstory, we're going to talk about the Dirt Club in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Now, it wasn't the first club we ever played, but it was definitely the first club that we became like residents, where we played all the time, twice a week at least. Um, You had to play a a weekday to get a weekend headlining spot. It's kind of the way it worked. Absolutely. And we learned how to work a stage. We learned how to work a crowd. We learned how to write songs. We learned how to work a mailing list. We... We learned a lot about how to be a great band at the Dirt Club. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, the Dirt Club was definitely the first club that I think we all felt 100% accepted as a band. Um, Before that, you know, we were like, we were kids when we started doing this. And especially in the original band, we were all really young. Um, Not even legal to drink, although we did. (laughs) And and the Dirt Club accepted us for that. Um, Johnny Dirt was, uh, you know, who ran the Dirt Club. Um, It was was a club. You were part of a club when you went there. You felt like you were were part of something. Um, And it was so special that you wanted to be there even when you weren't playing. Um, They would have bands Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday... Every week, original bands, and they have at least four or five a night. And and, that's, and I think, you know, I think that's what made it the scene is is that when you were playing, you were there. And when you weren't playing, you were there. Right. And so were all the other bands. And everybody knew everybody's material. And nobody, it, the great thing about it, too, is none of it was the same. There was so many different kinds of music. And everybody that came to the Dirt Club knew everybody else's music, no matter what kind of music it was. Yeah, I agree. You know, it was it was we all had our favorite bands um, and it was there was competition. I'm not going to say there wasn't, um, but it was friendly competition um, because we all got along. We all after the club was over at the end of the night, we all went to the diner together. We uh, we hung out together when there were parties on the weekend. You would see members of the other band at the parties you were hanging out at. It became uh, it became a click. And it was it was such a scene that we would party on Saturday night and then Sunday Sunday mornings we would meet in the park and play softball or go bowling together. Right, right. That's how come you know that's how how close we all were as far as that scene went. And the man responsible for this entire scene was the one and only Johnny Dirt, um, who what he fashioned this club after the Mud Club in the city, right? That was right. his whole thing. Yeah, he he had said he'd been to the Mud Club and he he just basically wanted to do a New Jersey version of it. And he did, man. I mean, he ruled that club and he was a legend in the Dirt Club. You didn't you you wanted to uh you wanted to hang out with Johnny. He was like everybody's like uh you know, <laughs> n- n- nutty grandfather. <laughs> and he treated us with respect regardless of whether you were 19 or 21 or 30. He treated you with respect. And uh, he, he treated you, with, I think, because he loved artists. He loved musicians. He loved artists. The the interior was completely done by local artists. It was yeah. like, you know, the men's room was full of like, I don't know, what was it? Plant cyclopses or something? Right. It was like they were watching you. while you were, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the one thing I remember about Johnny, uh, we can go on forever about Johnny. Um, he got so many stories. Um, Johnny never pulled any punches. Um, if he didn't like something about you or you did something a a little bit this way or that way, he he let you know. I remember one night (laughs) we were at the dirt club and we thought we were the coolest shit. You know, we were, you know, uh, you know, drawing really well. We had a a lot of people coming to see us play. Everything was a big party to us. And we just thought we were cool. I mean, we were just young and immature, but, uh, we thought we were really cool and we were a good band. But I remember one night after the show, we were complaining about how, All these bands were getting record deals. Everybody's getting a record deal. Why weren't we getting a record deal? We deserve a record deal too. And Johnny looked straight in our face. I remember this. And and you remember this too. You know what I'm going to say. He took us outside. He took us outside, right? He's like, 
you see this out here? And we're like, wow, what are you talking to me? He goes, when you could put a line around this club, then you deserve a record deal. Not until then. And it completely deflated us. Wow, he's right. That's right. <laughs> so, Absolutely. I mean, he never pulled any punches. And, you know, when you were in with Johnny, he treated you like one of his kids. You were like one of his, you know, one of his crew. And Rick the Sound Man was a good sound man, and he was right on the money. He taught us how to, to, to keep the show going. When he would say to you, listen, you got five minutes to get set up, you had five minutes to get set up. They did have a back line. They had drums and, and amps, so you had to put your guitar, you know, plug your guitars and put your cymbals on. But when five minutes was up, he announced you. If you were standing there, you were standing there. If you weren't ready to play, you were still standing there. You were trying to drink your Mirny iced tea that was on your amp. We had a, we actually had a thing. You, know, you remember, Dan? What's that? We'd put a water and a Mirny iced tea on the amps. Yeah. If the night was going well, you drank the water. If it was going bad, you drank the iced tea. <laughs> and that's how we got through some of those nights. So, so Mirny was Johnny Dirt's wife. Oh, right. And uh, Mirny worked the bar like a like a champ, and uh, she made the most incredible Long Island iced teas. Oh, man. And, uh, they God. knocked your socks off. And anybody that was at the Dirt Club in that time period, in that era, can attest to the fact that Mirny's iced teas were the best. Yeah, they would knock your socks off. Um, and like Nick said, there were many a nights that Rick would say, and now, on stage, and we would be tuning our guitars. Oh, and, yeah. and, you, and you learned real quick to be ready. Oh, you didn't want to look. Yeah. You didn't want to look like an idiot because you'd be, you know, the crickets. There'd be crickets going, and you'd yeah, be, you you learned. You learned. You really they kept it sharp. You, we we learned to function as as a real band. You know, it was no more. There was no more kid stuff. It wasn't allowed anymore. No, a hundred percent. Yep. So, the way in was the band we started. Most of the most of the stuff we played at. You know, most of the times we played the Dirt Club were with the way in, right? I, don't, I think I don't, it was o- only the way in. Yeah. And uh, and the way in was one of our earliest, our first original band. And like the Dirt Club, you made friends forever. There's people I met at the Dirt Club that I still am friends with now, and you know, not just Facebook friends, but real friends. You know, we meet in person. And yeah. uh, and same thing with the way in. Even though we're not together anymore, it was like lifetime friends. Yeah. And recently, after many many years of not playing together with the modern technology upon us, we decided to record one of our original songs from the early days. Yeah, yeah, we had this song back in the day. We had a a lot of originals back then that we wrote, but the one in particular that we played at almost every one of our shows was a song called Where Do We Go From Here? And we just thought it would be such a kick to get the five original guys back together. Um, some Some of us virtually, because a couple of guys live in Florida now, and uh, and record a 2021 version of uh, Where Do We Go From Here? And with modern technology, we were able to do that. And it was such a blessing because, you know, it was just great to be able to hear everybody's, you know, recording nowadays as opposed to back then. And it was so much fun to put together. Yeah, it was good. It was, had a very cool vibe to it to, to see, to think just the original five were were there on tape. So we're going to hear where do we go from here. But before we do, as always, um, we have a little question for you. So the question this time, if you've ever been to the Dirt Club, you remember there was something on the roof of the Dirt Club. It was very large. You couldn't miss it if you walked by the Dirt Club. So do you remember what that thing was? Let's hear where do we go from here, and we'll tell you right after this. Other girls to see, take a look out there. Well, it may not seem right, but you gotta try. Just don't keep the things that bother you bothered up inside. Say no. I just 
definitely is it brings is, back so many something. it brings back memories and it's just it's cool to hear a modern you know a modern version of it too yeah and it, you know what it, some things don't age well that did that yeah. song really aged well i, I agree i really so some great times playing that song it just brings back so many memories like when i hear the song it just I, it brings me right back to that stage oh, to yeah. being on that stage oh on that, the Dirt Club stage had that pole right in the middle. We got to <laughs> mention and the, the drips pole from above, and you, the, which we weren't sure where they were coming from. Yeah, we had, we had to. We, we learned how to work around a pole in the middle yeah. of the stage, and we learned how to dodge water. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the large thing on the roof of the Dirt Club was. Oh my God! It was this huge Statue of Liberty head with a light up eye. The, the eye had the bulb in it. Remember that? And uh, I don't know if the eye... The eye never really worked I don't, that. I don't know where he got it. I have, no yeah, I have a feeling it was second hand and he put yeah, it on the roof. He told you he just put it on the roof. Yeah. <clears throat> so we had a really special moment with the Statue of Liberty head because years later when the Dirt Club was torn down, everybody was going back and taking a brick for you know their memory of the Dirt Club. And so we did the same thing. We took a ride down, and there was the Dirt Club flattened. Yep. And we were walking around to get our brick, and there it was, the Statue of Liberty head, upside down, face down. We were like, oh, my God, there's the head. Yeah, they had actually just demoed the Dirt Club, like, the week before. And like you said, everybody was going to take, like, a little piece of memory from from the rubble. Um, it was sad. It was definitely a sad moment um, because so many memories and, you know, basically growing up in that club that's the club that we we learned how to be abandoned so either way we were like i said we were looking through the rubble and we came we came upon that statue of liberty head and i think we even didn't we even drive back to union to get a pickup truck we did we said we need to take this head <laughs> so, so we, we jumped we jumped on the parkway and headed from uh 148 mm -hmm. to 143 what is it? 141 14. yeah Grabbed our pickup truck and... Uh, and and then what was crazy about it was, so here we are in this truck. We got the big, huge Statue of Liberty head in the back of the truck. And then we realized we couldn't take the parkway home. We had to go all the back roads, like through Newark and Irvington and everything, and meandered our way slowly back to Union with That's a giant totally Statue of Liberty head. <laughs> people were staring at us like we were nuts. Like, what is that on the back of the truck? And of course, I think there were a couple of guys in the back of the truck yeah, too, right? right? We brought a whole team to, <laughs> yeah. to get it to happen. You know, it was like a, a Mission Impossible thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, you drive three blocks and get arrested for doing that. So but. do we? Do you want to tell them what we did with the head? <laughs> oh well, yeah. I mean, yeah, like a couple. Of, so our neck, our next, obviously, the Dirt Club was gone. So we were looking into other clubs to play, and we kind of migrated down the road to a club called Studio One which was a big rock club at the time. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll do an episode on Studio One alone because there's so many memories from Studio One. But I remember kind of as a paying like a homage to the Dirt Club, one night we decided to bring the Statue of Liberty head with us and use it as a backdrop 
for the band show. And we kind of cleaned the Statue of Liberty head oh, up. We, re- it. we rented a, a big truck to get it there. It we, like did. we did, we did. We put chains on it to <laughs> hang it. <laughs> and we restored that Statue of Liberty head. We even had the, the working eyeball going again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we did use it at one of our shows at Studio One. And uh, and I don't know, I think after that, we just stored it in a garage and, and lost, it got lost, wet and lost track of it. But it was good. It was a great, great. time at the Dirt Club. Great times. So that wraps up this episode of Backstory. I'm Quig. And I'm Danny. And we'll see you next time. Take care.